I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Ranga Diaz, Assistant Professor of both Mechanical Engineering and Physics and Astronomy at the University of Rochester. He joins us to describe his team's historic achievement of room temperature superconductivity in an organically derived carbonaceous sulfur hydride compound at the remarkable temperature of 58 degrees Fahrenheit. So Ranga, welcome. Let me begin by asking a little bit about your background and what inspired you to pursue the difficult goal of room temperature superconductivity. Um, thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talking with you about the, our recent uh, discovery. So to give a little bit of a background, uh, I'm originally from Sri Lanka. Uh, that's where I did my uh, uh, undergraduate. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, high school, middle school student, I always fascinated with science. Um, and then we, um, there is a, uh, a astronomy society in Sri Lanka called Astronomy and Space Study Center. Um, this society um, brings the uh, different uh, age of group of uh, students together, like undergraduate, uh, university, uh, university undergraduate, high school students, even middle school students, like sort of bring them together. And we have, you know, astronomy sessions, like uh, discussing about science. So um, I joined that club when I was like uh, 12 years old. Um, so that, that's where all this curiosity, you know, I always fascinated by science and materials, how they work. And then I start uh, listening to these kind of words, you know, physics and quantum physics, you know, although I have no idea at that time, but then uh, that's kind of a put me into the, the direction to follow the uh, science. So that's, uh, that's uh, how I uh, somehow end up in uh, uh, here in uh, Rochester. So then, I mean, after I finished my undergraduate, I joined uh, University of Washington, uh, Washington, sorry, Washington State University to do uh, my PhD. And from there, I did my postdoctoral studies at uh, Harvard University uh, with Professor Isaac Silvera. And then uh, I became a professor uh, here at uh, University of Rochester. Wonderful. Well, so as I mentioned in the introduction, you've succeeded in creating room temperature superconductivity in a carbonaceous sulfur hydride at a temperature of 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, prior to this experiment, I read that the highest temperature achieved was around negative 100 degrees, negative 70 degrees centigrade, or negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit in hydrogen sulfide. So would it be accurate then to describe this as a historic first for science? And how much time, energy, and research has it taken for you to reach this milestone? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely you can say this is the, definitely this is a landmark. Uh, we've been waiting for this uh, day for more than a century since the first discovery of uh, superconductivity in 1911. Um, uh, the previous record uh, in the sense, uh, the 203 Kelvin, the minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, this uh, discovery happened 2015 by uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, Mikhail Eremet. But then uh, he found another superconductor, another different type uh, called lanthanum superhydride, uh, which superconducted uh, 250 degrees, uh, um, 250 degrees Kelvin. So this is uh, give you sort of you know you we are setting onto the right direction. Uh, but when I was a student, um, I worked on uh, this uh, carbon sulfur material. I always fascinated with the carbon because of this multivalent nature of this carbon. Uh, I found a superconductor and carbon disulfide. So I already had sort of the idea this. Uh, uh, carbon and sulfur may be a you know trick to uh, unlock the secret of uh, you know room temperature superconductivity. Of course, then hydrogen has to play a, a role there uh, because hydrogen is the backbone of this uh, uh, kind of research. Because mm -hmm. metallic hydrogen theorized to be a room temperature superconductor, but you need enormous amount of pressure. Uh, then we started thinking about how we can bring this pressure. To lower pressures, uh, we are experimentally easily accessible while keeping the same metallic hydrogen properties. So then we start to think about instead of mechanically, you know, pressing this one to get these high pressures, can we do in chemical compression? Sort of like uh, um, to give you an idea, what is the chemical uh, compression? Is that let's say you are sitting in your room, you have four walls, and you just by yourself. You can bring all these four walls closer and closer together. You feel now you're getting squeezed, right? You're like, this is like a think of that as you're mechanically pressing them. But then if you add, keeping the walls same size, but you can add like 10 people around you, 
now you feel a little you know getting you're going to re uh, replace this 10 people with the uh, 10 defensive linemen if you're a football fan now uh, probably they're 300, 300 pound you know big uh, 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 sportsman so they you're definitely going to feel really tight now right so it's like that so instead of you mechanically pressing it you can chemically pre-compress it so that you will get the similar properties so then carbon and sulfur uh, found that it's a, a perfect candidate for this because if we want to make a metal we would like to have a covalent metal and carbon has a, a properties that you can make a multiple bonds you know have a very high coordination number uh, which uh, help to get into this uh, kind of state so i would say i've been thinking about this problem for more than a decade uh, we've been you know i had these ideas floating around carbon and sulfur and then i worked on pure hydrogen when i was at uh, harvard so this uh, sort of like you know you know uh, i would say in you know, a collective effort of last 10 years of thinking and doing extensive uh, research happened you know uh, very extensively um, in you know so rochester but the ideas were uh, building up to this for a long time yeah, yeah. Well, now, so for the layperson who may not be familiar with the applications of superconductivity, I guess it, at the very least, this could offer an improvement to the electrical grid, right, by eliminating conductive resistance in the wires. Um, I, I'm wondering, what are some of the other uses for superconductivity that helped inspire your work? Um, this, uh, the another one I can think of, the superconductor is not only zero resistance, you know, but if you let's say if you take your superconducting material and you're going to apply a, a external magnetic field so in general you know magnetic field goes through your sample you know whatever the material so then the superconductors they tend to expel had to go around it so this property we call that the perfect diamagnetism is that you can you levitate uh, something because of this property so think of now if you can make a frictionless train levitated trains that can have a tracks that there's no resistance so you can get a high speed train the, you know this technology sort of exists even now but you need a cryogenic you know there's a lot of cost for cryogenic you know cool it down to low temperatures keeping in that conditions that's gonna uh waste your you know the uh cry energy and the the uh material that you needed but imagine if you have something that operate at room temperature and you can do this one without any of these uh, needed the cryogenics. So that's one of the, you know, very important uh, application that I can think of for transportation. If you watch the movie uh, Back to the Future, if you remember, there was a, what, 19, 20, 2015, I forget exactly the year, they're having this hoverboard, sort of like, you know, you can pass through it, uh, you know, just floating. Maybe those kind of things can be uh, actual possible, not just a science fiction. So the transportation, oh, yeah. I, I would say, going to be dramatically changed. And then the other one is medical uh, side, the medical imaging. As of now, even we are using MRI scanners, these superconductors, but there's a lot of cost goes into cryogenics and you use a liquid helium to cool it down. And, but we are running out of liquid helium in our planet. So this, at some point, we're going to get into trouble. So having a room term superconductor, then, which means that you don't need those cry cryogenics, we can improve our uh, uh, MRI scanning, you know, other type of medical imaging system that can definitely improve. Uh, and then the four, another one I can think of is that the consumer electronic, you know, electronic devices. Um, imagine that you can make a superconducting devices, you know, um, circuits that have this uh, without any power loss, no uh, uh, heat uh, dissipating and uh, fast electronics. The, you can think of, you know, so many di di direction, you know, computers, your cell phone, things can definitely change. Even for quantum computing may have an indication that we can use the superconducting qubits at uh, room temperature. So um, electronic world will take over. I would say um, we will go from semiconducting society to, to a superconducting society, maybe. Mm, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. So now let me ask a little bit about the team that you work with on this. Uh, I mean, being with the University of Rochester, uh, you work with both the mechanical engineering and the physics and astronomy departments. Uh, are, are, who were some of the notable colleagues who helped you with the experiment and participated with the experiment? And what kind of backgrounds did they come from? Um, so my team, have, uh, all of my team, uh, as of now, I have graduate students who has a different background, engineering and physics. Um, so they all are trained to do this high pressure experiment. Uh, so they work really hard to, you know, uh, learn these techniques and develop these techniques, uh, setting up these all these labs. Because when I first joined here, 
um, it's it's an empty room, so there's no any uh, instruments or anything. So they work hard to put together everything uh, to get into this uh, uh, level. So I would say, you know, my students were heavily involved in this research. Uh, and then also I had a mentor um, from my university. You know, when I first joined, you have somebody who, you know, sort of guide you, a uh, senior faculty member, uh, Professor Rip Collins, who you know, helped me to guide through this, navigate through this uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, like is in your, new scientists, you know, coming into the, you know, this uh, uh, research area. So you need uh, some guidance. So he helped me uh, get in there. And then the, so my expertise are on low temperature physics, you know, how we can make this uh, superconductor, you know, the structure of this power, what, how the atoms are arranged. Yeah, which is a different different arrangement and why exactly this gives it uh, to superconducting uh, uh, properties. So then I have my colleague uh, who we used to work together when we were at Harvard, who is an expert in X-ray crystallography. So then I contacted him, you know, once we found all this superconducting and everything uh, for him to see whether he can help us to uh, understand the crystal structure. Uh, but the, the, being a light element, it's extremely difficult to do this X-ray diffraction. Uh, so he's developing new techniques so that he we can really do uh, um, you know uh, extra structural studies as well. So he uh, is the team member that who gonna help on uh, building this uh, that direction uh, in future. Ah, ah okay, okay. Um, so let me ask since you mentioned the X-ray crystallography, let me ask about the actual sample that you're using. Now phys.org described this as an organically derived carbonaceous sulfur hydride that you created by combining hydrogen with carbon and sulfur. So I'm wondering what led you to this particular chemical compound and what makes this suitable as a, for use as a room temperature superconductor? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, um, so if you, if you remember, if you go back to a little bit of history, in 2002, there was a discovery uh, of a superconductor superconducting at 40 Kelvin on uh, magnesium diboride, MgB2. It was like a pure covalent type metallic uh, state uh, material that has this superconducting properties. So in generally, you know, the two things that, you know, can uh, be very favorable for uh, superconductivity, lighter elements, strong bonds. Those two are sort of a very good criteria. And then hydrogen, of course, lightest element, uh, and then also can make a, a hydrogen bond, which is the strongest bonds. And then carbon and sulfur are very, uh, are, are the best candidate uh, to have a covalent metal because covalent metals are rare at ambient pressures. But with pressure, you can make this covalent metal because of the property of carbon and sulfur and also, of course, hydrogen. So I was thinking maybe if you wanted to go in that direction, the, the best strategy is to use a carbon and sulfur, which, which has the, the right chemical identity to form these uh, materials. So what we did was that we were uh, at 400 gigapascal and we used this uh, method called photochemical synthesis. So I used my green laser to shine this carbon and sulfur and then chemically react this one, photochemically react this one with hydrogen to make this beautiful crystal, transparent crystal, which has a carbon and sulfur and hydrogen, which was the magic material that become a superconduct. Um, have you seen the video of this making of this material? I have not. I have not. Now, is there a video online that, that you yeah, can point me to? Uh, I can send it to you and yeah, I can share it with you right now and guide you if you want. I can show you now. Well, let, let, let me actually, if you're able to send that to me. Um, yeah, perfect. Yeah, mystery. that might be a little easier. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, again, this is just absolutely remarkable work that you've done. Um, now, I, I wanted to. I wanted to say when when most people think of superconductors, I think that what most people are most familiar with is YBCO, right? The yttrium barium cuprous oxide materials, yeah. Yeah. and and those are typically created by a sintering process. I think in an electric kiln. So the, the carbonaceous sulfur hydride that you're describing required a lot more pressure to make. It required over 39 million pounds per square inch. Is the chemistry of this superconductor similar to, to YBCO in, in any way? And, and why was such enormous pressure required to make it? Yeah, um, so it's not similar. The mechanism, uh, um, I believe it's, it's different. 
uh, you know, YBCO is a cuprate type uh, superconductor, but I believe carbonaceous sulfur hydride more for like a conventional superconductor, which follows the BCS uh, model. Uh, so in that sense, like, you know, that, that nature, if you look at it, that di totally different directions. Uh, and then the why we need high pressure is that uh, one reason that, you know, you need to make a metal before you become, you know, become, become metal. Uh, before it becomes superconducting, you have to have metal there. Um, but you can't find this covalent metal at ambient pressure. It's very rare. But with pressure, what's happened is that, you know, if you take an insulator, you have a valence band and a conduction band. When you increase the pressure, what happens is these bands get broader and broader, and then at some point, they're going to cross. Mm. When you cross that one overlap, which means you have insulated to metal transition, the pressure is the magic tool that you can generate a, uh, a metals. So which help you to find a, a superconductor, you know, have to have enough density, electron density to have this high conductivity. And also same same time, you need to have the appropriate structure to have this high electron phonon coupling to be a, a superconductor. Uh, with pressure, you can really tween these structure the way you want it. Uh, you know, there are some bonds, maybe some structure may not be even, you know, possible or think of at uh, ambient pressure, but with increasing pressure, you, you may be able to easily get to these kind of that you never even thought can be possible. I mean, to give you an idea, a very simple example, I'm just gonna use something very simple. Let's say you are sitting on a subway compartment and this is non rush hour, you and another couple of people are sitting in, in, a, in the distance. So there's no gap between it. There's a lot of empty space. And if you go rush hour, a lot of people around you, right? Now that I, you can think of when you increase the pressure, you're gonna happen is everybody getting closer. You can interact, you can talk, you can exchange numbers or you can, you know, so, so it's just like that. Before you never had a, oh, I can't really make a bond with this atom, it's too far away. But now with this, oh, I, I can talk to this atom and I can make a bond. So things were not possible, can be possible with pressure. So to get an optimal condition, which means optimal structure, you need pressure to twin this one. So that was the beauty of using pressure. Ah, okay. Now, now to get this pressure, you use something called a diamond anvil cell to generate the pressure required. It, I'm wondering, could you describe how this device is capable of generating such tremendous pressure? And, and I, I also was wondering, did the superconductive effect in your sample persist after the pressure was removed? Um, so the diamond anvil cell, we, uh, it's, it's, it's a very simple device. Uh, think of this, you have an anvil shaped diamond. Why we are using diamond is it's the strongest material we know and also it's transparent, which means we can see through it. We can really study what's really happening in real time when you apply pressure. So you make this uh, anvil shape with the small tip size. In simple terms, pressure is force divided by area. So the smaller the area you have, you can generate a higher, higher end pressure. So what we did, we make this anvil shape tip shape with a tiny area. Uh, which means that uh, 100 micron in size, that's the flat area. It's so really small. Then even with the small force, you can generate no much amount of pressure because this is the tiny tip because you bring your uh, area really small. So you don't need a much force to really bring the uh, pressure up. So you make this two anvil and then you uh, prepare gasket in between these two diamond pre indent and you make a small sample chamber and then you just mechanically press them. So no magic, it's just mechanically pressing them with the tightening, you know, you have four screws, you have an Allen key, you just tighten the screws. Then you can bring this to, uh, it is funny in the sense that sometimes people think this is a big device in your lab and that can generate. No, actually you can have it in your hand and go to a pressure of the center of earth, just, uh, mm -hmm. just like that. So that's the device uh, yeah, uh, we use. And uh, the second part of your, your question, uh, we did not test what happened to material when we released the pressure because we were trying to push the TC. So we kept going up in pressure until diamond break because sometimes diamond break, you know, there's a time that can sustain the high pressure, they're gonna break. Uh, so we don't know whether uh, it's gonna go back to the original material we started or it's gonna stay the same. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Now the, the actual sample itself, 
the, the size of this was measured in picoliters, which means yeah. about the size of an inkjet particle. I'm wondering, how do you measure the electrical resistance and superconducting properties of something so small? And what kind of margin for error do you, do you have to fight against with those measurements? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so these, even though you know, sample size are really small, let's say our sample diameter is roughly like 30 micron in cubic, uh, diameter in 30 micron and maybe a few micron in thickness. What we do is that we use a very small same time of these very tiny uh, electrodes, like size of a two micron in tip size. So we can make these like a very tiny micro, uh, elect micro electrodes. And then, you know, by looking through the, your microscope, which you can enlarge uh, really um, high zoom, then you can manage to put these tiny electrodes, two micron, that just go and touch your sample. So it's like another mini world of mini, in, inside the mini world that has a tiny electrodes. And then what happens is when you pressurize it, those pressure gonna con, you know, make the nice contact to your samples. So then you have a nice four contacts in your sample. So you can use the two probes to send the current and then other two probes to pick the voltage. So you know the voltage and current easily using the Ohm's law. You can calculate the uh, the re resistance. So um, this this technique been developed over the years. Um, so you know it's not new. I would say 10, 15 years people been using this one. Now we are getting you know we are mastering it because of the current technology. There are ways that you lithographic techniques or fib focus ion beam or other techniques that you can really make a tiny electrodes so that you can do these studies for even small uh, samples. Oh, I, I see. I see. Now, so I, you know, I also wanted to ask, um, and, and this, this just kind of came into my mind earlier, but it, from, from other things I've read now using the diamond anvil process, I mean, that it's, that's something obviously to mass produce something like this in, in the far future that might not work, but, but I wondered, have, have you guys considered something like vapor deposition or, or something maybe potentially like the electron sputtering processes like they use, I understand that they, they're able to put a diamond-like form of carbon onto a substrate using those. Exactly. That's yeah. very, yes, yeah, so you're uh, spot on. Yeah. So for, I will take your same example that you, a diamond. So the diamond is the high pressure form of carbon, but uh, it's metastable, which means if you release the pressure, even though if you make it under pressure, it doesn't go back to uh, original carbon form. But then people found a way that grow these diamond even laboratory right the, just like you explained using the chemical vapor de deposition you can grow by atom by atom these uh, uh, diamond so just like that probably if you understand what's the real structure and the chemistry in our material so if you find the right substrate we can grow we can maybe use a similar technique like cvd chemical vapor deposition or mbe molecular beam epitaxy you know the, the beam by beam but maybe we be able to grow this or print this material so that can definitely make it, you know, uh, large quantities uh, will be probably useful for uh, real application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so even like, I, I mean, obviously wire comes to mind and that might be difficult to make with something like that. But then you would also mentioned going from a semiconductor world to a superconductor world. And it would be interesting to see things like that are part of the chip fabrication process, right? So. In, in theory, that and I guess chip fabs are used to working with semiconductors. So it might not be difficult at all to take chemistry like this and move it into uh, computer chips, you know, for, for whatever yeah. use it might have there. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, you may, maybe we be, I mean, one thing I, I know you mentioned, I mean, um, you know, how you can really make a wire of these carbon and sulfur materials, right? So it just like, do we need a more of a, like a ductile material so that we can make a wire, so things like that. But the thing is, it's a high pressure form of this material. We really don't know. Like even though we use carbon powder and sulfur and hydrogen to mix together, but when you go to uh, these high pressure conditions, we may be making an alloy. So then if, if it, that's the case, then which means you can definitely use this as a, uh, uh, you know, like a material that, you know, semiconducting device or wires or, you know, any of these kind of, you know, electronics that you, uh, you need. It. Um, I, I know this is too early to say it, but it seems like there are more work that we can do in order to really, you know, understand what's, what's a really high, high pressure form. And from there, we can sort of uh, picture our, you know, uh, superconducting uh, society.
Well, yeah. And, and that was actually, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about because, you know, so now that you've achieved this, I, my, my thought was now you have a lot of data to work with, right? You have a lot of proof of results and proof of models. Does this point the way towards other materials? Or do you think that this material itself might be something that, that you would pursue for like eventual commercial applications? Uh, again, very good question. Um, I, I would say it may not be exactly this material that we're going to go into already make the commercial uh, material, because I think the, the next challenge is somehow understand and bring the pressure all the way to ambient pressure right? and operate at room temperature. So to, in order to do that, we maybe have to have a substitute some other materials into this system. Uh, you know, chemical tuning, we call it, uh, maybe selenium will do the job um instead of sulfur or maybe something completely different some metallic iron uh, material can be the case lanthanum or yttrium or scandium uh, i would say at this point you know it can be something totally different you know we will take this as our base material but from there we will mold we will tune the the composition uh, to bring the pressure down all the way that you can use for uh, a real application. You're absolutely right. It may not be exactly the same composition. It could be something uh, built upon this. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I also wanted to ask about the upper field limit and critical current density. W were you able to measure these at all? And if so, did they did they fit kind of the limits of, uh, you know, what what a traditional superconductor, I guess, the cryogenically cooled ones have? Yes. Uh, the, so the uh, the uh, upper uh, the upper critical field magnetic field. It's it, we what, what we do. Is we, we don't have a magnetic field that go that high, but uh, we have a magnet that goes up to nine tesla. So we were able to do the measurements up to nine tesla. Then if you use the the standard superconducting model called Ginzburg lambda model, you can extrapolate where the high critical field going to be. So that's uh, turned out to be uh, sixty two tesla. So that's a very high uh, 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 value. And then the current density, we have not directly uh, uh, measured that one. So we need to do more experiment. But when I do the uh, rough calculation back of the envelope, they are very much go into a, a, like MGB2 type, you know, the conventional superconductor, the high critical current and high, you know, uh, magnetic, critical magnetic field. So they very much will work like, I would say MGB2 or um, even the niobium uh, so that will, be, which means that it will be very useful for practical application because you wanted to have a high current density and high fields, right? Otherwise, you can't really sustain this one. Uh, you know, you you send us you know, some amount of current, then you're gonna destroy your superconductor if you have a low critical current. So then, even though if you have a room temperature superconductor, it may not be useful. But uh, these uh, in the uh, early calculation and the uh, field uh, uh, calculations and the the magnetic field studies uh, tells us. The direction that it, it is high and it follow the uh, this mgb2 type uh, niobium type uh, uh, superconductors mm, mm. Yeah. well yeah so that i mean that was actually that was uh that was all of my questions i i, I do want to close by asking what comes next for you and your research team and your work in superconductivity um, where should we where should we be looking for you next in the headlines <laughs> uh, well um so definitely my you know immediate uh, uh, task is to how I can figure it out to make it at ambient pressure and then make it to have actual an application. So that's gonna be the high priority uh, coming with the different materials or maybe building upon here, how I can really make it to uh, ambient pressure. So in that note, uh, we form a new company, startup company with my colleague uh, uh, named Unearthly Materials. So the, the direct focus of that company is to make this uh, material in large quantities at ambient pressures so that we can actually have a, a practical applications from that. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, yeah, and that, that was all of my questions. And I, you know, I'm, but uh, yeah, again, this is, this is amazing. And the thing, that, the thing that excites me the most, I guess, is you, you already have a focus on commercial applications. And you know, a lot of times with scientific achievements like this, it, I, I think that um, it, it's easy to be so focused on the achievement that once you get there, it's like, okay, what next? And in this case, you're already looking at the commercial aspect of it. And like you've talked about potentially trying to make ductile materials for wire. Um, do you think that might be difficult to do or? or... Uh, 
Um, I think I think we have a very good chance if you compare. You know, I know like you know, superconductor been there for like more than century, and then last hundred years nothing has happened much, right, in the superconducting world. But since 2015, the, the every day you know you will come up hydrogen disulfide, 200 Kelvin, lanthanum sulf, uh, superhydride, 250. I think we are very you know short period of time, like the last five years. So many things have changed in superconducting world. Um, so with this, you know, you know, drive and this excitement, I think uh, we may be not that far to get an actual room pressure, room temperature superconductor. Yeah, yeah, the one that's commercially viable. Yeah, viable, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you think that the change is because, is that because of computer models and just better understanding the physics? Yeah, exactly. So computer models definitely help, you know, some of those material were theoretically predicted, which were not the case before. So that definitely uh, playing a big role here. And then, the, of course, this hydrogen. You're realizing that hydrogen play this main role making room temperature superconductor, which we were not really focusing in last, you know, a couple of decades ago, I think changed this whole, you know, it, it, the 2015 paper sort of the paradigm shift. Now we are already in a, like a totally different uh, direction, which has a many, many, many promise, uh, promising results. Um, I think, yeah, competition power and uh, understanding, better understanding what real the mechanisms are definitely helping us to uh, get this uh, feed very quickly.